welcome back to Act 2, Scene 1, Part 2. Uh, so, we left off with Desdemona asking Iago to praise her for the second time. And Iago, up here at the top, around 1.30, says, I'm about it, but needed my invention. I need, I needed some time to think about it. Yeah? Um, and he says here at line 135, Is she be fair and wise, furnace and wit, the one's for use, the other useth it. Which basically, if you look across the English, if a woman is pretty and smart, she uses her good looks to get what she wants. Um, which obviously speaks to this idea of women's beauty being the most important attribute at the time. But again, that's something that could be said about today's society. Uh, now, Desdemona's response to this, I think, is the most interesting. Well praised. Now, she could be praising the fact that it's, you know, look at how well he's expressed that. He's being very witty he's been very poetic he's very using great wordplay there to convey his ideas and this shows Iago's intelligence um which is why as we say later when Cassio says do not look to him as the scholar well his language here reveals that he is very intelligent with words and um, something that will in Act 3 be used to manipulate Othello into a jealous fit um, and then she she prompts him to carry on how if she be black and witty? Now the power, the word black there is obviously ironic. Um, but the, and again, it's used to to indicate someone who isn't fur, so someone who isn't um, pretty. So if you have a look at the English, it says very clever. But what if the woman is smart but ugly? So it's just a very, again, it, when we talked about ingrained racism, that this is an example of that. That Desdemona has married. A black man but will use the word black to describe something ugly um so iago continues carrying on being his witty self basically having banter rap repartee on gender basically they're they're having back and forth to distract desdemona arguably about women and how the beauty is the most important thing um, as Iago says in the English version, even if she's ugly, she'll be smart enough to find a guy to sleep with her. Um, so she'll find a white that shall her blackness fit. So there's something for everyone, but it just seems very bitter, as I've said there, and indicates that some men will just have anybody. Um, or that a woman can use her intelligence to sort of overcome her physical appearance, which actually you might say is quite positive that that's something that's actually almost respecting women's intelligence there and um, Desdemona's response there though is worse and worse so it's ironic that or at least my from my perspective she responds quite positively to a negative point and negatively to a positive point and um, this is a lot more detailed than you'll need in your exam the whole point is that Iago suggests um that he's willing to engage in this sort of banter in this it highlights his intelligence and also his respect towards women is perhaps limited um but then Amelia joins in as well how is firm foolish so they're all sort of getting involved it's just a way of just taking away the time the next two lines Iago says she never yet was foolish that was fur so nobody is sh stupid if she is beautiful for even her folly helped her to an err. So basically, her stupidity would help her to win a man. Which suggests that women always win, as I've written there. Also, this idea that men are silly. Men men are attractive to stupidity in a woman, in a woman if she's pretty. Um, also, this idea that if you, you get an err, so if you, you basically get married and you have you know your future and you can carry on your family name well carry on his family name then th that's a success for a woman so and again this is more contextual idea but just to sort of stress that the prominence of finding the right husband was it, you know that was women's priority at the time so i think it puts into perspective this just how brave desdemona was to marry a fellow that was literally her one job in life yeah to help herself to an err uh, and she picked a fellow um, and I just think it really captures how brave and how much in love with him she must have been, which then obviously makes the ending more tragic. Um, Desdemona just laughs it off. Oh, these are stupid old jokes that men tell each other in bars. These are old, fond paradoxes to make fools laugh in the alehouse. Um, so almost, I guess, she's jibing in there. Oh, this isn't that clever. This You're just saying 
things that have been said before. Um, and then she asks him another question. What miserable praise, that's a lovely line. Um, there's a bit of an oxymoron there, isn't there? Um, what, what negative praise do you have for someone who's foul and foolish? So this is some, a woman now who's both ugly and stupid. Um, and Iago says, there's none so foul and foolish there unto, but does foul pride, sorry, but does, so, no, that's the one over there, but does foul pranks which fur and wise ones do. So no matter how ugly or stupid the woman is, she plays the same dirty tricks that the smart and pretty ones do. So I think this is very ironic because he's arguing there that women are always tricksters, women are always um, getting sort of exp uh, expelling power over men. And yet, actually, that's exactly what he does as well. And, you know, why wouldn't he admire this? This is something that he's doing as well. But there's an, I know this is all very funny and he's just playing a role here, but there's an indication here that he feels uncomfortable with the amount of power that women have. Um, and that it just, it disquiets him that, that women are always sort of feel, he feels like they're always winning one over on him no matter what they are. Uh, so... Desdemona, again, sees this as the best praise <laughs> that someone who is ugly and fur is always pulling off the best tricks. And she says, you praise the worst, the best. Um, you could argue that that is a symbol of Iago's virtues. And that is a great line to symbolize that actually out of the entire play, you could argue that here is Desdemona, who, who most accurately captures what Iago is. He is someone who values the things that everybody else does not. Also, Desdemona is suggesting though that actually the, the worst kind of woman is one who's ugly and stupid, um, it's a bit mean. Uh, so she then asks him for praise that she he would give to a deserving woman and, and very much I think I feel here, that's what she sees herself as. So she's kind of, again, digging for a compliment. And then we have this brilliant, um, section of rhyming couplets from Iago it's absolutely perfectly composed he does it off the top of his head obviously Shakespeare probably spent a long time crafting this he's extremely entertaining to the women if you have a look there you can see proud lad gay me um, is that high nigh fly rail tail mind behind and um, you've got this just fantastic collection of rhyming couplets that he's using to describe women um, and you've got to respect that that he's got that intelligence to do that um at the end though we've got um she that could think and never disclose her mind see suitors following and not look behind she was a white if ever such rights were um, and if you have a look at the english version there it's uh, someone who could think without revealing her thoughts so that portrays women as very closeted yeah and that's likes to that she that could think and never disclose her mind and who could refrain from flirting with men in love with her, that kind of woman. So someone who could actually not flirt back with somebody who is in love with her. And then, so this is like this amazing woman who would do all of these fantastic things. But then Desdemona says, well, what, what would she do? And there's this great contrast here. This, we've got this massive build up of what, what the perfect woman could technically be. And then Iago has this great sense of um, anticlimax at the end. Oh, well, she would suckle fools and chronicle small beer. She would raise babies and clip coupons, which actually does speak to the fact that a lot of women's talents were wasted in, the, in this society. And Desdemona's rejecting that. So you could argue Desdemona's a little bit feminist here because there are a lot of women who, who lived that life who wasted their talents. Um, but she hates this conclusion. Oh, most lame and impotent cloak conclusion that's pathetic in the english version but it is actually true and i think you can argue here that desdemona is strongly believing that women can do more than that that women are more valuable than that um, and you can think about in act three how that affects her own relationship and then we talked about the following quotation in class do not learn of him amelia though he be thy husband desdemona acknowledges here that amelia should respect her husband that she should listen to him and that she should sort of follow his lead and then Desdemona playfully tells her not to do that um, but we can see here that Desdemona strongly believes in loyalty and um, you should have those notes from class from sport uh, and then again we've talked about this Cassio quote as well you may relish him more in the soldier than in the scholar so again this idea that 
he really, really underestimates what Iago is capable of here, as does all of society. Are we ever really capable of seeing how how much evil is possible in the world? There's many instances of that. Um, nobody could have imagined the Holocaust, for example. Um, but again, we've got here that Cassio is very much on the women's side and he's got manners. He speaks home, madam. Yeah, the, even the word madam. So then we've got an aside from Iago, which would be very dramatic as a, as a basic band three argument. This is very dramatic on stage because obviously you've got Cassio taking Desdemona's hand on the other side of the stage. And you've got to ask yourself why here. He doesn't need to do that. So Iago is, is evil, but he's actually taking advantage of something that is possibly inappropriate anyway from Cassio. Um, and we'll see how Othello feels about this in Act 3. He's actually quite confident about his wife being a bit of a flirt and a bit of an outgoing person. Uh, but Iago says, he takes her by the palm, I well said, whisper. So he's whispering in her ear, yeah? And with as little a web as this will I ensnare a great a fly as Cassio. So that's a great quotation to remember. Firstly, because of the web imagery and the spider imagery, which Shakespeare does build upon later on this act. But he's basically an evil little villain there, isn't he? Plotting to capture Cassio in his web. And he's the spider in the middle. Um, and again, it, it happens exactly as he, as he plans to. Okay, But it just highlights that he's, he's actually building on Cassio's own manners. So Cassio's partly to blame, arguably, by giving him this, this way in, really, and making it so easy for him. Um, he then says, if such tricks as these strip you of out of your lieutenantry, so again, his motive, if you lose your job because of this flirtation, you'll wish you hadn't been so courteous. Is he also angry that Cassio has good manners? He says later on in the play that Cassio's beauty makes him ugly. So you can argue that there's an insecurity here. Iago will never be what Cassio can be. This is not just jealousy over a job. This is jealousy over Cassio's entire status, the respect, the way he's got good breeding that Iago doesn't have. Okay, now finally, here comes the more. Woohoo! Um, so again, we've got this is very good time in the Shakespeare ends Othello's absence. Iago's very much ready to, to, to go, ready to get him, ready to get Cassio. Um, and in comes Othello, the more. So Desdemona is very excited. Let's meet and receive him. Let's go and greet him when he lands and in he comes. So very quick, pace is quick. Shakespeare is not interested in delaying this. Othello's safe. And we talked about these two quotations in class. Oh, my fur warrior and Desdemona, my dear Othello. So the lexical field of warrior is used throughout the play. And um, as we talked about in Act 1, Scene 3, Desdemona uses a lot of uh, masculine language linked to, linked to war. Um, so Othello calls Desdemona his warrior, which is a traditionally masculine um, thing. And Desdemona calls Othello dear, which again is linked to femininity. Um, Othello reveals his love here. It says, it gives me great wonder, great is my content to see you here before me. Oh, my soul's joy. That's a lovely metaphor. Um, this idea that she's very much embedded into his soul now. Um, he's captivated by her. He's overruled by her. And he's going to find it difficult to balance that with his other duties for the rest of the play. Uh, and then there's this lovely irony here. If after every tempest comes such... such calms may the winds blow till they have wakened death so you are the calm after my storm the tempest is the storm desdemona is the calm and if i always get to experience this joy of finding you at the end of it then i will go through hell i will go through all these storms and i do not care um that she's worth it but of course by the end of it she becomes the storm she is the storm in his mind who's causing him all this jealousy and insecurity this need to to, to be violent um, so there's just a bit of irony there that she stops being his source of calm. Um, Iago becomes that. So technically you could argue Iago supplants Desdemona. He becomes to Othello what Desdemona once was. And once Othello has opened himself up to this idea of um, love and, 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 and passion that, that you know he's, he's more easy to manipulate. 
Um, he then says, um, if I were now to die, were now to be most happy, for I fear my soul have her content so absolute. It's interesting that he calls his soul a female. My soul has her content so absolute. Um, he basically says, if I was to die now, I would be really happy. Yeah. Uh, and I probably would never be this happy ever again, if you look at the English version there. Um, I'm going to come back to this idea of fear and how you worry about losing things. I think there's better evidence for that in Act 3. Um, Desdemona kind of, it's almost like agrees with this. Um, if you look at the English version, God willing, our love and happiness will only increase as we get older. It's almost like a little pact, like vows. Um, heaven forbid that our loves and comforts should increase even if our days do grow. So they both have hope. They bo and Amelia, um, Desdemona doesn't mention the word fear. She's not afraid that she'll never be as happy as this ever again. She's just happy. Um, and again, it's just a nice starting point for, for Act 2, which obviously by Act 3 it's going to be very different. Um, and then Othello sort of cements this idea of it being a bit of a vow. He says, amen to that sweet powers. Like they're praying to God about their relationship. I cannot speak enough of this content. It stops me here. It is too much joy. He's overwhelmed. He's just overwhelmed by his love for her, um, which is one of the negative re no negative things. You could argue that this play is um, a warning sign against love overpowering you. We've already talked about that for Rodrigo, but this is more evidence here. It stops me here. It is too much joy. He can't cope with it. Um, Okay, and just to make a brilliant contrast on the stage, um, you've got this lovely juxtaposition of Iago, again, aside to the audience, oh, you are well tuned now, oh, you're very happy now, but I'll set down the pegs that make this music as honest as I am. I am going to destroy this. And again, he's just, he's just malicious here. He's very malicious. He's seeing this happiness and it's not making him way there. It's actually giving him more drive to destroy it. Um, and again, you've got a lovely metaphor at the end this idea of love being music. Now, Othello is super happy. He's survived his war. He's beaten the war. He's got back to his wife quicker than he thought. Come, let us to the castle. News, friends, our wars are done. The Turks are drowned. So, the war is over. And he says, it's lovely The Oh, my sweet, I prattle out of fashion. I am so happy. That's just line 193 there. Um, and so happy um, and he goes I pray pray thee good Iago go to the bay and disembark my coffers so he's basically using him again good Iago good Iago yeah um, moving on right so Othello and Desdemona and all their attendants go off and we have left with Iago and Rodrigo here um, yeah, Argo opens with an order. Do you do that? Meet me presently at, at the harbour. Come and meet me at the harbour. Um, and then he tells him an out and out lie. He tells him that Desdemona is directly in love with him, being Cassio. Um, so this is the start of his plot. And Rodrigo feels like he's in, he's inside the plot. Is actually just another part in the plot because I think this is the first time he actually directly lies to him. He he misleads him or encourages him. But this is him literally lying to, to get the plot. He want, he needs to get Rodrigo to want to fight Cassio and provoke him. Um, so, Rodrigo's like, how? How can she be in love with Cassio? Don't be ridiculous. And the I was like, lay thy finger thus and let thy soul be instructed. So shut up and listen to me. Uh, mark me with what violence she first loved the more, but for bragging and telling her fantastical lies. So we know that she fell in love with the more because she, he bragged and told her made up stories. Did you expect her to keep loving him for this chattering? You must. You're not as stupid as that. You're too smart. So let not thy discreet heart think it. Don't believe that she will continue to love him. And then the bit that's underlined, her eye must be fed and what delight shall she have to look on the devil. So she needs someone nice looking and Othello is ugly. Okay. She then says, when the blood is, sorry, he says, when the blood is made dull with the act of sport, there should be a game to inflame it and to give it satiety, a fresh appetite, loveliness and favour, sympathy and years, manners and beauties, all which the more is defective in. So he thinks that she needs all of these things. Um, like fresh appetite, loveliness, sympathy, manners, beauty, 
and Othello doesn't have any of those. So now she's going to start looking elsewhere. Very nature will instruct her in it to compel to some second choice. So he's indicating that Cassio is her second choice. And why? Because he is all of those things. He's a smooth talker. Um, he's far more civil, etc. So by the time this speech is over, and that is quite a powerful speech. Look how organised it is. He kind of justifies first why Othello isn't worthy of her and why she's going to get bored of him. Then he says, so she's going to look for someone else. She's going to look for someone like this. And then he says that that's what Cassio is. Um, he's young and handsome, etc. He's a devilish knave. Yeah, handsome, young, and have all these requisites in him that folly and green minds look after. Green again linked to jealousy. Yeah, and the idea of pastures being greener. Rodrigo is is just I can't believe it. She's full of most blessed condition. So Rodrigo and I put the trust that Desdemona would never treat cheat on Othello more than Othello does. <laughs> Othello is 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 convinced um, and here Rodrigo's and I mean I suppose Othello originally does say don't be ridiculous but here she's like nope no nope, I can't believe that she would never do that 